Hey, I'm Dave Anthony, and I'm very excited to lead the Manitoba Junior Hockey League playoff previews, detailing all four series heading into round number one starting this weekend. On the panel this year, we have from the Niverville Nighthawks, Kevin Pauls, from the Portage Terriers, Cody Bueller, and from the Winnipeg Blues, Coach Alex Mandelitis. Guys, thank you so much for doing this today. You bet. Thanks for having us, Dave. Yeah, All right, so we'll talk here. a little bit. Of, we'll talk a little bit about each uh, each playoff round and each playoff series, and we're just going to kind of go back and forth. Let's open it up in the Western Conference with the one versus four, Verdon versus the Nipawa Titans. Nipawa kind of getting in the last weekend. Verdon locking down top spot. Kevin, let's start with you. You've seen the Verdon Oil Capitals a number of times this year. What makes them so difficult to play against? Uh, they're a very well disciplined team. They can play a physical game. They can score. Uh, Eric Reed's played some great goaltending for them as well. So they really have all the facets that make them a successful franchise. Um, Tyson Ramsey does a great job with his coaching staff to make them a very formidable opponent night after night. They're consistent and I expect them to bring their best. Cody, uh, do you, do you believe they have the defense that can stand against some of the, the Nipawa Titans attack, which they're a little deeper than I think a lot of the league gives them credit for. If there is a little bit of an area of concern, is it defense of the oil capitals? Well, I know we. I just had a chance to see the Oil Caps recently, uh, and the Terriers were able to put up some points on them. Uh, but the Oil Caps do have a good defense with Bielik, their captain on the blue line. I was really impressed, actually. Uh, Tyler Dodge, the former Terrier, uh, went to Winnipeg, and now with Burden, uh, I thought he looked really good on their blue line. And so I will see how they do against Nipawa. I was really impressed with the Titans this season. Every time I saw them, they came to play every night. Uh, and they're a team, I think, that'll be sneaky in the playoffs. And I don't think anybody can count out the Titans this year. Absolutely not. I mean, they are deeper up front than maybe they have been in years past, and they don't rely on just one or two guys, even with missing uh, Cody Gwinnison. Uh, Mando, take us through what it's like to plan against a team like the Verdon Oil Capitals that has the depth that they do. They have they roll four lines. They have snipers on all four lines. How does a coach prepare and handle that kind of depth? That's always the the tricky thing with playoffs, right? Like, how do you want your matchups to be right are you are you trying to shut down are you going to go fire with fire right and it's hard to do like you said with burden right they have the experience of last year their guys are a year older right so they've kind of been through it and they're a little bit hungry to um obviously be crowned champion right obviously it starts with a hard series against nipawa nipawa has been playing very strong just to get into the playoffs right so they're kind of riding that um uh, emotional high right like credit to can right like I think it was seven years that Nipawa hasn't made the playoffs so they're going to be excited about that but yeah like it's you know you're hoping that your best players are your best players and your depth guys can step up and, and that's ultimately what you need and you know like Nipawa has got some solid goaltending as well so you know, it's going to be a tight series yeah and, and you know what Nipawa hasn't rolled over in their contests against Verd and Kevin what does that kind of regular season success do for the playoffs or do you think it even translates at all well, I think Mando said, you know, and Cody both mentioned that they're a tough team to play against night in, night out. They're going to bring their hardest effort. And, you know, Kenny Pearson's done a great job with that group. So, I mean, I think the the regular season is in the past. I think it's just a matter of who brings that compete and who wants it more come game time. Because, uh, you know, the Verdon Oil Capital, the Capitals have a lot of dynamic players, but the the Titans are sneaky good. And I think they might surprise a lot of folks. Yeah, let's go back to that idea there, Cody. Uh, you, we, I've seen the Titans recently. They're a hardworking group. They really rely on their top six and their top four defense, and then Mason LeBro in goal. Uh, do you think that though? Do you think they have enough to get through wave after wave of burden? Like, where do you see Nipawa being able to to maybe take advantage of the Oil Capitals? Well, I think they're going to be kind of a defensive uh, structured game if they want to beat Verdon. I think trying to shut down their forwards is going to be key. And then if they can kind of withstand the storm, all of a sudden a couple of quick strikes and Nipo will be able to find the back of the net. So I think if they want to, if they want to win, they're going to need good goaltending like in any series. But I think that's going to be really important for uh, Nipo is to fend off the waves and then just do a couple of quick strikes if, if they can coming back the other way. And I think they've got a chance in this series. Mando, from an outside perspective looking in, I would say Verdon's all in this year. They've got a ton of, of talent up front that is older. They have some guys that may be moving on at the end of the year. They're really invested into this year. Nipawa, is, is, they have a very bright future. They're kind of playing with house money. Do you believe there's pressure on the number one team hosting the you know the number four team? Do you think Verdon's going to maybe feel a little bit, especially if Nipawa keeps it close or maybe even steals a period or a game? 
I think so. I think, yeah, you know, when, when you have that success, I think last year, you know, they were, they was burden playing with house money, right? They, you know, they kind of surprised a lot of folks and, and, and teams. And so now the expectation is right. Like we have to get back there. Right. So if Nipua can disrupt their game plan, um, you know, maybe like you said, steal a game, uh, you know, keep things tight and get a lucky bounce, then, you know, the pressure definitely is on burden, but, you know, like, again, there's something to be said about that experience about having gone through it. They won a lot of different ways uh, this year. Right. Um, you know, like, you know, you look at special teams come playoff time. Right. And, you know, I think that's going to be critical for Nipawa, right. Like they're, um, we'll have to shut down uh, a very potent uh, burden power play. Right. Uh, Curtis Brolin does a good job there. Shout out to him. Uh, worked with him with U16. So, know a lot about uh, some of his tendencies and such, right? But, um, but yeah, like, you know, you look at it, like, Nipawa maybe didn't have the, the best PK, but, you know, those always kind of get uh, augmented in playoff time, right? Guys want to block more shots. They want to be more disciplined. So I think that'll be a critical uh, part of this series, right? We'll see kind of how it all plays out. But, yeah, you're right. Like, if, if you know, if Nipawa stays hot and they keep playing that team game and team style and, and capitalize on some chances, then – you know, anything can happen. Kevin, uh, as our goalie expert, uh, take us through the battle in the crease. Eric Reed has played more hockey than anybody in Canada. It seems he's, he's been in the net every night. And then Mason LeBro is a young goaltender. He was in the MJ showcase. He got a taste last year as well. Take us through what you think of the battle of the goaltending in this series. Well, Eric Reed plays against a little different structure um, than uh, behind a different structure, I should say, than um, Mason LeBro does. So in a lot of cases, I feel like the verdant oil caps limit your chances, whereas LeBro sometimes has to make saves in tough circumstances. Um, but that's not to say that he can't steal games like Mando mentioned earlier. I think it's going to be that basically the goalie that makes the, the stops when they should, maybe a little extra here on the power play. Um, but consistency, I think I'd lean more towards Eric Reed. However, um, there's there's no sense in LeBro not being able to to make some incredible uh, saves, especially you know in a packed house in Nepo off what you can expect for that series. Cody, just looking at the goal scoring for both clubs, they both have guys that can fill the net. But who are who's maybe someone from Verdon and someone from Nepoa you expect to be game breakers in this series? Well, we've seen some really good offensive numbers uh, for both teams, and uh, Verdon, I really feel like they're uh their high-end guys are the ones that have been really stirring the drink for them uh josh leto uh, uh the former terrier uh he's he's looked really good every time we've seen him every time i've seen him he has just been outstanding for them um i definitely think he's going to be key for verdon up front and every time that we've i've seen verdon they just keep coming in waves and their offense has looked uh, really good this season I've also been impressed uh, for Nipawa with Hayden Stocks. I think uh, he's a guy who's uh, going to be important for the Titans. You know, yeah, the big question for me in, in this series, if Nipawa goes down, do they have the firepower to come back? Uh, we know if Vernon goes down, they have some guys. Chasco's got 30 goals this year. Uh, they got Rubazin at 17. They got Nathan Miller who potted 17. They have the offense to get back. I don't know if Nipawa does. They do have some depth with, behind stock. Colton Alexander, Tim DeConnick's played really well. But uh, Mando, take us through uh, if a team ends up going down, the mindset that they're going to need to have in a series like this where maybe it is going to be hard to find that big goal to come back. Just take us through a team's mindset if they end up going down in a game. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, it's always tough, especially, you know, depending, like, everyone's, like, in their room, I guess, like, they're thinking they can do this, right? If they have that sense of belief and that they just need one shot, one chance, and they keep it tight like that, then, but, you know, if things get extended, it's sometimes tough to overcome, right? And especially with a young team, um, you know, but, but yeah, like, you, you know, stocks coming back was a huge bump for that group and it changed their entire I guess, trajectory, right? And Connor Thompson's playing well, Casper's playing well, right? So, you know, again, like some guys that maybe are having a little bit of swagger and a little bit of confidence and maybe, you know, again, something to be said about playing with house money where you're, you're playing a little bit free, right? And so, but it, it, it no matter what, right? It's always tough. Like, you know, again, you know, like when things tighten up and you, you're not getting those chances, then, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to overcome. 
All right, so guys, as we wrap up each series, we have to give our predictions as to what we think. And again, with all respect to both clubs and all the clubs involved, we know it's hard to win in the playoffs, but somebody has to win in a certain amount of games. So we like to just kind of throw it out there and what we think. Kevin Pauls, we'll start with you. A series prediction, Verdon versus Nipawa. Well, ultimately, I'm super happy for the the town of Nipawa to be back in the playoffs. I think they're really going to enjoy it. But I like the Verdon Oil Capitals. They can play, uh, you know, a game where they can punch you in the mouth and put the puck in the back of the net. So I picked them to win in five. Cody Bueller. Oh man, I know uh, this. I think the series is going to be closer than people think. I've seen a lot of good things this year out of the Titans. So I'm going to go with the hot take. I'm going to say the Titans with the upset in the first round in seven. Alex Mandalitas, what do you think? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> Both teams have fun. <laughs> no, uh, I think um, I think I think Verdon takes it in six. Yeah, I'm gonna lean towards that as well. Verdon in six. Uh, I like Cody's hot take though. I think Nipawa is gonna be more of a handful for a myriad of reasons, and it's really gonna push Vernon, which could help the Oil Capitals as they move on down the road. Because if you walk through the first round series, it it could be one way, but if you get pushed, you got to respond, and and the Verdon depth is gonna have to respond against a scrappy Nipawa team. But Cody, I love the hot take of Nipawa in seven. It's something about the home ice uh, made by Tom Lissaway that maybe helps the Nipawa Titans give Tom a shout out there for, uh, for what he does. All right, guys, that is series Verdon versus Nipawa in round one starting Friday. Let's go to series uh, number two in the Western Conference. The Blizzard versus the Dauphin Kings. This is going to be a fascinating one. The Blizzard are maybe the hottest team in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League. The Dauphin Kings, I thought, were going to be on the way down after the trade deadline, but they have responded in a way uh, maybe few outside the parkland thought they would. This should be a fascinating contest where game one might have so many overtimes, they might be playing well into Sunday or Monday with the way these two goaltenders can go. Kevin, from the outside looking in, it's going to be hard to score in this series. Uh, take us through your thoughts, the Blizzard and the Kings. Uh, I think it's going to boil down to opportunities on the man advantage. I think the power play and penalty kill are going to play such an integral role in this series because the goaltenders are that good. You know, a guy like Cole Sheffield and, and Thomas Anderson are two dynamic goaltenders. They can steal a game for their respective teams. And I think it's going to be who converts on their chances and making do. Both those rinks are going to play a pivotal uh, you know, uh, point in this series as well. You know, it's hard to go into Dauphin with that horn all game long and, and OCN is no easy uh, rink to go into either. So it'd be interesting. Yeah, and they've really been packing it out. We got to give a shout out to Jen and the wonderful staff there that has put a lot of bums in seats. Cody, um, you know the Dauphin Kings. They have a long history in this league of being ultra competitive. They always find a way. What about this year's group has made them special? And, you know, they piled up 38 wins, only two less than, than the top club, Verdon. Why has this club been so successful, specifically post-trade deadline? Well, they're a really good team, and I think they've been getting uh, good goaltending. I think their goalies have played well all year. Sheffield has looked uh, really good at times, a 921 save percentage over the year. Uh, when you get that kind of goaltending uh, throughout the season from your netminder, that's going to be huge. And so I think the Dauphin Kings are in a really good spot, and I think this should be a close series. Alex Mandelitis of the Winnipeg Blues. Uh, for the life of me, I've watched the, the Blizzard play all year, and you watch the results, and they are just one of the most fascinating teams maybe in the MJ's history with how structured they are. They have some snipers. I mean, Sebastian Hamming is among the top defense in the league. Of course, they've got the, the greatest goaltender in the league this year. But take us through structurally why it's so difficult to play against the Blizzard. Yeah, I mean, it, they really have, especially as of late, right? I think they went on that hot run. And, you know, I, you know, I was talking with uh, Coach of the Year, Eric LaBrose, right? Like, when they play their structure, they're very, very strong and very, very good. Um, and even, like, they're coming from their captain, Sarge and Sebastian Hamming, um, they just play with pace. They have good sticks. They play connected hockey. So when you're trying to manufacture and create offense, it's stifling because they have layers, they have bodies, they're – they're, you know, they're a tight five. So, you know, they limit a lot of chances. Right. And so again, you know, they've, they've been playing kind of playoff hockey for the last kind of month of the year. Right. So does that continue hopefully, right. Like it'd be awesome to see there's some, you know, like they're by committee team, you know, like they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, their scoring depth comes from everybody. Right. So, you know, they're a well-rounded group and, you know, that's, that's what makes them hard to play against. 
Kevin, for the Dolphin Kings, they lead the the MGEU West division in penalty minutes. They're the only club over 900 in that division. And their penalty kill was eighth in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League this year at 80.6%. If there is an area concern for the Kings heading into the series, is it the penalty kill? Is it special teams? That is going to be the biggest factor into what ends up happening with them. I think so with, you know, uh, Mano mentioned uh, a guy like Sebastian Hamming and how well they move the puck on the back end. And then you have some X factors like Marlon Edwards. It can really blast the puck. He looks like Ovi on the far circle sometimes. And they have those guys. Quincy Suprian is another guy that can uh, contribute to that dynamic offense. And that's something that I would steer clear of if I were the Dauphin Kings. Try to play disciplined. Try to keep it five on five. Let your goalie be the difference maker. And then, you know, lay in the reeds and wait for a mistake. Cody, again, it's going to be hard to score in this series for both clubs, but the Blizzard have never been one to necessarily be, you know, show-stopping goal-scoring club. Uh, Riley C is the only mar- is the only guy with over 20 markers. He potted 23. They've got some depth, though. Bouvier, 18. Suprian, who's had a really good year at 17. Then it kind of drops off a bit. Do the Blizzard have enough offense to get through a Kings team, whether it's the defense or the goaltending? Well, balance is really important in the playoffs, and I think even more so in the playoffs than the regular season, because in, in the playoffs, you often get matchups and you get line matching. Having those guys that are tough to match up against on your even third and fourth line, I think that's going to be key. And one thing is, too, the Blizzard, their building always gets rocking in the playoffs. And that's one thing that they have home ice advantage this year, playing out of the Roy, as they call it up there, uh, in the paw. Uh, they've got a great atmosphere and a great crowd that shows up in the playoffs. And that's going to be a a factor for them. A smaller building, they know how to play in there. They've got that advantage, uh, have being the higher seed. And so I think that's going to be a factor too. And that's something that they can try and capitalize on against often. Mando, you talked about, um, you know, Eric LeBros and what he's done this year with the Blizzard. Doug Headley, again, a really good job getting the most out of the Dolphin Kings. From a coaching side of things, uh, you have to make adjustments in game and in series. So take us through, you know, the adjustment side of things and which coach maybe will feel a little bit more pressure to make the right adjustments as the series goes on. Yeah, no question, right? Like you want to stay true to your game and what got you there and what you're playing well with. You know, that's the fun part about, you know, this time of year, especially with the last few games, right? Like you're you're pre-scouting your your team versus their team and you're noticing these nuances of them getting tighter in in defensive structure and four check and offensive ability, right? There's less risk in their game. So that'll be the interesting thing, right? And so, you know, I I know Eric's coming from uh, great programs in the, in the queue, right? But then Header's been, been there before, right? So he's, he's done this and, you know, maybe doesn't have the same depth as other teams, but he's retooled really well with some good players like Ashton Paul back in the league, right? Uh, Great ability to be a game breaker in that, that shot that you need for a goal. So, you know, it's interesting, right? Like, you know, how do they counteract against each other? Um, You know, uh, to get the right right line matches out, do you tweak certain things? Uh, It'll be interesting to see, right? Like it's, I I don't have a a right answer because it's kind of sometimes that coach, the art of coaching, right? Where you, you have a hunch or you try something and it works. And then that's the, that's, that's all you need to create some separation. Could it come down Mando to which coaches may be more aggressive at certain points of the game, instead of being reactive, they're the ones that are the, the, that coach is going to lean on one line or, or one specific uh, group to get the job done and, and force the other coach to react. Could that end up being the difference? I think so. I think, you know, like you look at, you know, Dolphin, I'm, I would imagine that their big guns are going to get a lot of ice time, right? Whereas maybe the Blizzard might still go with their balanced attack, right? Where they have, you know, they're rolling everybody and he has a lot of confidence and trust in those guys. Right. So maybe that matchup works, works for an opportunity, but you know, you never know until you play. Kevin, uh, we'll get you to focus in on a key player for the Dauphin Kings before we hear Cody uh, with a player for the blizzard, who is going to have to step up if the Dauphin Kings want to come out of this series and uh, get into round number two. Oh boy. Um, I like players like Jordan Bax. So uh, um, Mando mentioned Ashton Paul earlier too. He plays such a physical game. Um, he contributes on all portions of the ice and, and he's got, you know, game breaking abilities too, but really it's hard for me not to, not to talk about the goaltender like in Sheffield. Like um, I think it's really going to boil down to him making the extra save. I think this series is going to be a war of attrition and see who's left standing at the end. 
Cody, you can focus in on a member of the blizzard. Are you looking up front defense goaltending? Obviously, like Mando says and Kevin says, uh, they really do rely on depth up front. But is there somebody that ne- needs to step up and become a playoff hero for the blizzard to move on? Well, like you said, uh, goaltending and offense, obviously important. All, all facets of the game are important, but I'm looking at their defenseman, Sebastian Hamming. Uh, 20 year old defenseman. He's going to be playing a big part on the blue line. He plays in all situations and is going to be key for them. He had 52 points. He was tied for the team lead this year in scoring. And so when you get that kind of offense from the blue line, he's going to be relied upon. And I think uh, he's going to be a big factor in this series. Mando, before we get series predictions, uh, we talk at length about how hard it is to going to be to score in this series, despite some of the snipers on both sides. If you're a coach on the bench and your guys are starting to pile up shots, 25, 30, 35, and they're not finding the back of the net, what do you say to a group that is getting goalied in a game and how do you keep their spirits high so that they can eventually break through? Uh, it's just, In that situation, it just takes one more, but I think you know trying to trying to get them to get to the net a little bit more, disrupt the goalie's eyes, take away what he can see, create some chaos in the crease, right? Like usually playoff goals aren't the prettiest, right? So it's got to be dirty and greasy. So, you know, be net front, stay above the puck, you know, create create secondary scoring chances. And that's usually how, you know, things work. Or, you know, never, be a, never pass up a shot would be another one too. All right, gentlemen, time for our uh, series predictions. Just want to throw out there, the Blizzard had the third best road record, 21 wins on the road compared to 18 at home. Meanwhile, the Dauphin Kings better at home than they were on the road. The Blizzard have home ice advantage in this series. Kevin Pauls, who do you like and in how many games? Well, I think this is probably one of the closer series as far as picking a winner, but uh, I got to go with the OCN uh, uh, Blizzard in this case. Um, I, I think they maybe have the X factors. Um, it's it's so close to call, but I think that home ice advantage for a change for them is going to make a big difference. So I, I picked the Blizzard in six. Cody, you got uh, coach of the year this year with the Blizzard versus a champion just two years ago in Doug Headley. Uh, both kind of younger groups, but uh, who do you like in this series? Well, the Blizzard have been rolling. They are 9-1 and one in their last 10 games. I thought they've looked really good down the stretch. I think that they are going to do really well against the Dauphin Kings, even though they are fairly close geographically. So uh, they're, the travel shouldn't be a huge factor either way. I think that uh, the Blizzard are going to take it in five. That, that one loss, though, I believe, came against the Dauphin Kings in the paw. So the Dauphin uh, Club can feel a little bit better about uh, their game, especially on the road. Mando, uh, Blizzard Kings round one. I know you hate to pick sides here, but uh, who do you like and why? Yeah, I think, you know, young groups, I think we're going to see some, you know, as much as we're going to see structure, I think we're going to see some emotional highs and lows. So I think as goes the distance, I think uh, Blizzard, I'll give it the Blizzard uh, in seven. Yeah, and, uh, you know, again, it's going to come down to who can score the big goal at the big time and who's comfortable playing in low-scoring games. And I think the Blizzard have done that more so than the Kings have. Uh, So I'm going to go with uh, Mando's pick, too, and I'm going to take the Blizzard in seven. Uh, That should rile up a few people in the parkland, and I'm sure they're going to let us know if we get it wrong. Uh, Gentlemen, thanks (laughs) for doing this uh, West preview for uh, Blizzard Kings round one starting Friday. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Let's break down the Eastern Conference round one starting Friday between the first place Steinback Pistons and fourth place Niverville Nighthawks. Kevin, we'll start with you as you have seen this team up close and the dramatic change with uh, Kelvin Check out, uh, Dwight Hurst in. Take us through some of the noticeable changes that helped the Nighthawks get into the playoffs this year. Well, you know, after stumbling about halfway through the season, the Nighthawks kind of had to re-identify themselves and figure out what was going to be the elixir to success. And Dwight Hurst has done a good job through accountability. Um, You know, they've changed their structure on the special teams a little bit, especially the power play, which has seen a little more success of late. Um, Raiden Legal seems to have found his stride as well. He's played some really good goaltending uh, down the stretch here for the Nighthawks. And they're going to have to go in at their best, and they're going to have to find confidence no matter how hard it is facing a pretty formidable opponent in the Steinback Pistons. 
Cody, it hasn't, as Kevin said, been an easy ride for the Nighthawks. It's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Do you think that's going to help them in the playoffs? Do you think it's may- maybe made them a little mentally tougher? Or is it going to have the after effect where they're not going to be able to dig out of the lows because it's not a sprint? Uh, it's a sprint now. It's not a marathon. You have to be able to dig out rather quickly. Take us through what your thoughts are, the mentality of the Nighthawks going into round one. Well, they're going to need something like that to kind of rally around because they're coming up against the juggernaut. This is the biggest gap we see in point spread between uh, all of the matchups in the playoffs this year. There's a 33 point difference in the standings between Steinbeck and Niverville. Steinbeck was the only team to have single digit regulation losses this year. And so when you just look at that gap, Niverville is going to need something to rally around if they want to make this a series because they're going against a really tough uh, division rival, uh, very close geographically. There's going to be Steinbeck fans coming to Niverville because exactly because of how close they are. It's going to be a really tough series for the Nighthawks. Mando, uh, the Nighthawks are, are kind of playing with house money right now. They get into the playoffs second time in a row as the newest franchise in the MJHL. Uh, like Cody said, they maybe have the biggest points uh, differential. They have far less games played, uh, far less playoff points. So they're really coming in. They got to feel a little bit fun and fancy free. And can they use that to their advantage and maybe, you know, play a little looser and find a way to 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 get through the tough Pistons defense because maybe they're not expected to. Yeah, I think, you know, especially with the changes that have happened, they're probably looking at it being like, hey, like we're all we're all at zero wins, zero losses, zero ties right now. And everything's, um, you know, from scratch, right? Blank slate. So. You know, they like like uh, Kevin said, they, they've changed a few things. Um, you know, they're getting some um, some bite and some jam from, you know, Brownie and and, you know, a few other guys. Right. So, you know, maybe they you know, maybe they have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder and that, um, you know, that uh, want to prove guys wrong. But I mean, it's it's a tough place to play that uh, rink and labrokery. Right. So, I mean. If, if you're if you're sleeping or you're too riled up emotionally right like it could be uh it could be tough to overcome but i mean the, the fans in neverville and that community right i think you know they're going to be like the seventh the seventh man right when when going into that place so you never know right like they could sneak something out kevin uh just looking from the regular season goal differential steinbach plus 141 neverville minus three 181 goals for the Nighthawks this year. Steinbach's been very content to play low scoring games. Uh, do, uh, just take us through the challenges that Steinbach are going to possess defensively if they get a lead and how hard it might be for the Nighthawks to to be able to break through that consistently. Well, I think the trick is going to be remaining disciplined and keeping things in focus. And I think Paul Dick does a pretty good job of of mitigating the, you know, some of the the feelings that some of the players may have. He's a really good coach. Let's just call it what it is. And the Nighthawks kind of have to look at it like a David and Goliath type scenario. Like you're coming in here with less pressure on you, you know, the defending champs, they certainly want to make sure they put forth a good effort and then keep the juggernaut rolling forward. But this is an opportunity to go and, and, and show that whatever has happened is in the past. We're all like Mando said, starting at zero here. Um, yeah. There's a big goal differential, but right now, the Nighthawks can know that they did win a game in LeBrokery in overtime. So if they are close games, limit your um, the opportunities for the opposition. Don't hand them anything. Make sure you play hard on both sides of the puck and, and just go in there and try to disrupt things as best you can. Up front, Cody, I know the, the Pistons and the Terriers have gone head-to-head a number of times this year, and you've seen uh, the offensive depth for Steinbeck can get them out of tricky situations. It can extend games so that other teams can't come back or can find the big goal when they need. Take us through your thoughts up front of what Steinbeck is going to hand Niverville. Well, I know you're going to love this, Dave, me singing the praises of some of the Steinbeck Pistons players, uh, but Leo Chambers, Kirk Mullen, I really like the pickup of Trey Sauter at the deadline. I think that just makes uh, that team so much deeper up front. And I've really liked what we've seen out of Brandon Funk. There's a guy who's continued to improve every year in this league. And uh, he's he started at 16, so he's got lots of experience for a young player. They've got so many uh, offensive weapons on this Pistons team, and they look so good on the special teams. Niverville has to stay out of the box and stay disciplined if they want to make this a series. Mando, uh, just take us through 
the maturity side of this series because Steinbeck, like we mentioned earlier, they're okay to play a, a two one two nothing game. They're they're okay to keep it really low scoring. Niverville has to be okay on both sides of that as well. If they start getting a little bit too jumpy, then all of a sudden things can kind of get out of hand. So just take us through uh, the maturity side that both clubs are going to kind of need to show in this series if they want to come away with a win. No, absolutely right. Like I think for Niverville, they have to take away. Uh, Steinbeck's transition game they're one of the fastest teams in the league they've got depth and right and so you know if they can play a structured defensive game Legal, right like you know young goalie but committed goalie for a reason he's he's one of the tops in the league um so you know like you get you get some big saves from him and that kind of maybe opens things up and you know they they do have a good power play in, in coil right let the defensemen in scoring so you know you have guys that can 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 hopefully give them that boost but but yeah like the you know it all comes down to mindset and belief right like if you're if you're looking at the spreads like Cody's saying right the point differential then there, there's probably not a very good chance but if you have that sense of belief that you know like all you need is one one opportunity one chance and you play connected hockey then you know you see it all the time where you know the underdog story right that's why we love sports like you just never know it's not predictable right so I think, um, you know, if they can play that connected hockey and, and and give themselves that opportunity, then they'll grow in maturity, right? I mean, obviously, Steinbeck's been there before. They've retooled really well. Obviously, some new people, new players, but, you know, at the same time, like some guys that uh, were there last year so can share that experience with, with the, the new guys. Going all the way back uh, into the 1950s, it, it still looks like Steinbeck has given up the fewest goals in Manitoba Junior Hockey League history. Uh, Portage came close back in 15-16, in but 103 goals against in just 58 games. Kevin, uh, that's a pretty amazing stat. Who up front for Niverville needs to step up and, and throw all that out the window and be the difference maker? There's been a few guys that have stepped up of late, but who do you have circled as someone who's going to become a playoff hero if the Niverville Nighthawks move on? Uh, well, you know, they rely on guys like Michael DeBrito to put the puck in the net, but there's so many too, like Ty Kennett's been playing really well. Um, Brendan Bottom, another dynamic player. Um, hopefully they'll get Carter Spearig back for the playoff run. But I think it's going to boil down to the support players too. Adam Vigbison, um, Brett Tatarin, the, the the captain, guys like Luke McKenzie. All those guys need to find a way to contribute because if it is an anemic scoring chance scenario like you talked about, they're going to need all hands on deck for this one. If the Nighthawks have any success, it's got to be by committee. Cody, for the Steinback Pistons, they have a mix of forwards uh, who have been here before. Of course, a number of guys from the championship team last year, even a couple from the, the finals run the year before. They've mixed it in with the rookie of the year, Grady Hoffman, and some new additions like uh, Paranuzzi and Sam Note. Who do you expect to have a bigger impact in the series, the veterans or the rookies? I think it's going to be some of the young guys. I think Brandon Funk, again, not a rookie, but I talked about him before. I think he's going to be important. And I don't know what you guys have been doing out in Steinbeck with your goaltending, recruiting, and scouting, but uh, the goaltenders for Steinbeck, and I'm sure it has partially to do with the system and the tight defense in front of them that they keep putting up great numbers every year, but it uh, looks like both goalies have been playing really well this year, and I would imagine Plowman will be the guy in the playoffs, but he's going to be uh, he's going to be a big part of their playoff run. And I think that Steinbeck's team has been playing really well this year and uh, should look good against Neverville. So, Mando, you've had to go up against both of these defense cores. Steinbach's uh, a little bit bigger, a little bit more of a puck mover. Niverville's deeper than I think a lot of people give them credit for, and they quietly go about their business, and and they've done well. And, of course, Cole Plowman and goal for Steinbach, right in Legal, a big shutout in uh, Verdon the other night, and then the, the victory over Swan. Take us through your thoughts defensively of both these clubs and how you would plan against that if you're Steinbach or Niverville. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely exciting to finish the year to get in. Like, who, who would have, who had that, right? Like, going into to Verdon, a, a strong team, and, and getting a must win uh, in a in a shutout, right? But you know, like, I, you know, you look at David Cote and and a few of the other defenders on Steinbeck. They have such length and reach, and they're mobile. And they, 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 you know, they're good positionally, right? So, you know, again, like when we're talking in the in the West of, of teams that play structurally sound, like it's very hard to manufacture offense. And I didn't realize about about the, the you know breaking or setting a, a goals against average or against since like 50 years, right? Like that's impressive stuff. So, 
you know, they're, they're so quick, right? Like they get pucks fast. They, they break out very quickly. That's what I mean. Their transition game. So anything, any way that, uh, you know, Niverville can maybe play that heavier game and ground and pound and wear them down a little bit and put a little pressure on, um, you know, the defensive team, the goaltending, right? Maybe they're not used to it. Maybe they're, they haven't had to play in their own end as much, right? So, you know, finding little crinks in the, in the armor there, but, um, you know, like, it's so hard to do. And I, I think, you know, the forward group that Kevin talked about is that they do like, they like to kind of play in the mud a little bit. Right. So that might be that, um, you know, that, that difference in, in styles. Right. And so, you know, that might be an edge in, in, a, in a period in game. I'm not sure, but um, I think that's what we're going to see. Yeah. It's going to be about the defenseman going North. If they start going East West, that's where a lot of uh, the problems are going to occur for both clubs. Cause uh, they got some heavy four checkers on both sides that love to cycle and love to work from the corners, go low to high. So if the defenders want to play around in their own zone, they're going to end up uh, maybe pulling a puck or two out of their own net. Uh, Kevin Pauls, we'll start with you for series predictions. Uh, given your pundits picks history, I really don't know what you're going to do here. Uh, so we'll give you the floor. Who do you like and in how many games? Well, no one can con- contest the fact that the Steinbach Pistons are at the top of the league this year in so many categories, whether it be goaltending, defense, team defense, and, and their scoring ability. The Nighthawks are um, an intangible towards the, the Steinbach Pistons. When, you know, talking with Coach Dwight Hurst, he's saying, he's showing them, look at there's teams out there that have that have fallen bigger opponents and, and have risen to the occasion. So I'm going with David on this one, and I'm picking the Nighthawks in seven. It's going to be a dandy. Cody Bueller, you've seen both clubs a number of times this year. They've, uh, you know, had to go up against your Terriers. They've had some highs and some lows. What do you like about this series, and who do you like in how many games? Well, I think, uh, like Kevin was saying, Niverville's going to have to have that belief. They can't come into the series feeling defeated already before it even starts. They have to believe that they have a chance. I personally don't believe they have a chance, and I think Steinbeck's going to take it in four. Alex Mandelitis, your thoughts? Another guy that's planned against both these clubs throughout this regular season. Uh, you know what both can do when they're on their games, and we expect them to be on their games starting this Friday. Uh, who do you like, and in how many games? I um, I like I do like Steinbeck. Um, you know, again, just from top to bottom, but uh, I like the the community in Niverville and the crowd that they're probably going to get, and it's going to be emotional high, and like they do have some. Some players like the Brito can rip a puck, Licky, right? Like so Denny, like they they were brought in for this playoff push. So uh, I think they get one. So I'm going to go with five. It's time back. Yeah, I think Cody brought up the point when talking about the rookies. Um, I I've been able to see them. Obviously, I can see the depth that that Steinbeck has, and you know as they get more healthy as well, their that confidence grows. But talking to the veterans like Hunter Dagelman, Kirk Mullen, Cole Plumman, guys who have been there before. You think that maybe they wouldn't be as hungry coming off a championship, but they want it even more. They think, uh, you know, defending a championship is harder than winning a championship. And Cody, I think you and Portage could probably attest to that. Defending it means a, a little bit more than maybe winning it that first year. So I like Steinbach in four. I think, uh, you know, offensively, they're deeper. Defensively, they they move the puck well. Jack Cook, Noah Zabo, David Cote, Spencer Penner, Parker Jasper, go down the list. Uh, I just think they're going to be too much over 60 minutes for Niverville to handle. So Steinbeck in four. Continuing on with our Manitoba Junior Hockey League playoff previews, we get now to maybe the most polarizing opening round series with all due respect to the other matchups, Winkler versus Portage. This has all the indications of being the premier opening round series where Whichever team gets knocked out in this round could make a case they could have won the Turnbull Cup this year. I, I really believe both these teams have that capability, but one is going home early. Uh, Kevin Pauls, Cody Bueller, Alex Mandelitis joins us in the roundtable. Kevin, uh, this is going to be a battle of two Titanic franchises that do not like each other. Uh, Winkler has had a phenomenal year. The Terriers, I think, maybe have outperformed some expectations from around the league with the way that they have played uh, take us through your overall thoughts uh, with what the Winkler Flyers are going to bring to this series. Well, you know, make no bones about it. The the Portage Terriers bring a great deal of winning pedigree and a phenomenal coach in Blake Spiller, and that'll create a big test for the Winkler Flyers. You know, of late, they've stumbled a little bit. They are a heavyweight team. They've got some big players 
Um, they play really well out of the corners and they've got great goaltending behind Malachi Clausen, which are two important contributing factors to success. But I think they're going to be in tough if they can't stay disciplined and stay out of the penalty box. They're going to have to find a way to match the portage rush because they are very speedy down the wings. They're going to have to play some pretty tight, tight defense, but I think it all boils down to how much Malachi Clausen can take over a series. Yeah, well, they got some big-time scorers, but Cody, the way the Portage defense has come together, especially post-deadline, you look at all the moves that uh, the Terriers made, they have all worked out, and I would say Ashton Fishley is maybe the best acquisition uh, any team made at the deadline. He has fit in and exceeded expectations uh, by by quite a bit. Take us through the the way the Terriers' defense has come together and what they're going to have to do to be successful against the Flyers' offense. Well, Dave, you might have to cut me off because, as you know, I could talk all day about the Portage Terriers. Uh, the defense at the trade deadline was a huge area that we addressed. And so Ashton Fishley, like you said, was probably the biggest get. Uh, also adding Aiden Brook alongside him. You initially, you brought in two defensemen that play on what could be considered the top, sometimes the second pairing, and it just pushed everybody down a little bit, which just made the blue line that much deeper. And Ashton Fishley is one of those players who fits in so well in the community. When he was here initially two seasons ago, he won the Community Ambassador Award for his involvement uh, in Portage, of whether it's volunteering and working in schools. He works at a school. He's involved in a bunch of different programs that we run. And he actually won Fans' Choice again this year. And so it's not just on ice, off the ice. He's a big part of this team. And then coming in as a 20-year-old with some playoff experience last year in Swan Valley, he's taken his game to another level offensively. Uh, I think the defense just got bigger. It got better. And I think that uh, that's going to be big uh, heading into this first round. Yeah, it's it's some massive humans up front for Winkler and some massive humans defensively for the Portage Terriers. Alex Mandelitas, uh, take us through what makes Winkler and Portage respectively so difficult to play against. We'll start with the Winkler Flyers. Um, yeah, like they're, I mean, the Juicer's been having them play like playoff hockey, kind of a chip off the old block, right? Since game one, I mean, we fi- we started our season with them and we finished our season with them and they haven't changed one bit. I mean, obviously, um, they come at you with fast, they're athletic, they're, they're, they're strong, they're big, they check well, you know, so, you know, I think they're hungry too, right? Like last year's first round series against the Pistons was one of the best, right? Could have gone either way, really. Um, so I know they're hungry in the back of their mind about that, right? So they want to have you know, a great start. But then, yeah, you, you flip over to Portage and, you know, like Cody said about their acquisitions, they did get more athletic. They got bigger, they can skate. Like their transition game is very, very fast. So, you know, and they've got depth. They've got guys that can put the puck in the net. They don't have the same type of um, scoring as Winkler, but it's well balanced. So it's 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 going to be a great series. Kevin, let's talk about goal scoring. We know that Winkler can work down low and and put the puck to the front of the net and outwork just about any team in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League, maybe even in the country. Uh, but Portage is pretty good at defending the house, so Winkler's going to have to find different ways to score. Are they capable of adjusting the way they find offense? if their normal way isn't succeeding and they're not getting the power play opportunities where they feasted as well. Take us through your thoughts on how they may have to adjust to goal scoring and if they're going to be able to do it. Well, in order to earn success at the top of the league, like you've seen with the Pistons, it's much the same for the Winkler Flyers. They are going to have to find a way to adapt if their, you know, punch to the mouth um, methodology doesn't work out. You know, if it's not working out of the corners or you don't get those power play opportunities because you know, the chances may be few and far between from the, the Terriers. It's going to be adjusting and finding that secondary scoring, using guys like Nick McKee, uh, Brody Boschman to use their speed down the wing and go create chaos and not just rely on the big towers like Zach Nicholas and Dalton Andrew to fight for pucks out of the corner. And look how good Trent Penner's been as well. So there's a, a lot of talented individuals on that Winkler team. And, you know, they're too good not to find another way to score. Yeah, we should say Jacob Jones has fit in really well. He wasn't a deadline acquisition. He was picked up earlier, but he's fit in really well with the Winkler Flyers. Cody, um, Amando kind of touched on it there. If there is one concern, perhaps it's going to be the timeliness of a Portage goal. We know what they can do, uh, you know, in the first 40 or 50 minutes of a game. Are they going to have enough of the high-powered offense to get them a goal in a key moment if it's tied late, if they're down a goal late, or if games go to overtime? Are they going to have that offensive punch? 
Well, that's really the thing. This year, it's been different guys stepping up at different times. And right now, I don't even know what I would call the top line for Portage uh, heading into this series. Uh, every night it changes. We've been seeing different line combinations, uh, different matchups. The fourth line has gotten a lot better, I feel. Uh, Johnston and Johnson playing together have looked a lot better. And so with so many different combinations and different options, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, who steps up in the playoffs. I think uh, Nolan Nina won team MVP this year. And coming in with his first year in this league, I think he's going to be a big part down the middle for Portage. And he's going to be relied, relied upon veterans like CISO and Stanek. This is their third year as a Terrier. They're looking for some playoff success. I think there's going to be a lot of guys who have an opportunity to step up. And we'll see who takes it. Mando, uh, the Flyers have a top power play, top three penalty kill. The Terriers are surprisingly in the middle, <laughs> both power play and penalty kill. So if special teams do become a factor, and they usually do, maybe the edge goes to Winkler. But take us through your thoughts on the special teams battle and how it could be the difference in this series. No question, right? And, and you know, again, like we, we we played Winkler and we played Portage uh, to finish out the year. And again, you, you're, you're pre-scout and you're seeing like their changes and their nuances. Um, you know, Winkler's trying some different things. <coughs> Excuse me. They're trying to, you know, generate some offense from right on top of the house. They're so heavy. They're strong. Uh, like Kevin said about their big bodies, getting Nicholas back. That's a huge get, right? You know, I think... You know, Svensson as a 20-year-old, I think he has a little bit more in the tank and he's got a, a great shot that, as well that can open things up. So, um, you know, but again, like we, we keep coming back to um, Portage's back end, right? Like they got guys that are going to block shots. Like Parker Shear is battles and competes, Gislason and, and Fishley and Brook, right? So um, typically in playoffs, the, the PK – step up and out compete the power play because they're just more on the line right they're going to block shots they're going to win face-offs right like that's going to be a a fun fun kind of metric to track is the face-off circles all year uh winkler like they want to punch you in the mouth and you know it's seven seconds of hell to win that puck so it'll be interesting to see like how that kind of plays out right because you know like special teams are so critical in that in that aspect right so you know even just like the the breakout ch changes the, the pk up ice it's really going to be a cat and mouse game and you know, from a coach right when you're breaking it down like that you're really excited and interested and intrigued right so um obviously the players but the team game is going to be the one that's going to get it over the you know through the through the second round Absolutely. And again, uh, special teams numbers in the regular season get tossed out. You can really establish a power play in a series early. And if you find something that works, both Blake Spiller and Justin Falk are not afraid to go back to that well over and over. If it's finding success, they will figure it out and then they will make adjustments if they do see in game. I think they're two of the great tacticians in the MJ. Kevin, uh, let's go to the goaltending battle. You talked about Malachi Clausen. I believe Jaden Catelier is going to get the lion's share, or at least the start in this series. So we'll start with Malachi Clausen. Uh, he's had a, a really good statistical year. There's been times where he's let in the odd goal uh, in, a, in a game where it's kind of kept a team hanging around a little bit. You can't really do that in the playoffs. Take us through your thoughts on Malachi Clausen. Well, of all the goaltenders in the league, I probably know Malachi personally the best, uh, aside from maybe Raiden Legal. But I talk with Malachi, and there's a guy who's, you know, mental fortitude is up there among the best. There's a guy that really wants to win. This is his 20-year-old year. He knows, <clears throat> excuse me, that he's making a case for his future career as well here. And he wants to win. This is his hometown He's a big game goaltender that has a good firm handle on things. He's athletic. I think it boils down to the structure of play in front of him. Uh, Winkler had a lot of, uh, you know, additions on their, their back end as well. And they've kind of been mixing things up and trying new things. And I think they'll have that figured it, uh, figured out coming into this playoff run. But I fully expect uh, Malachi to bring his best. And, you know, Jaden Catelier is a fantastic goaltender too. I've seen him play fantastic hockey and uh this is going to be a battle that's going to be fun to watch i've got my popcorn ready yeah cody let's talk a little bit about Jaden catelier he's been a terrier now for a number of years so you've watched him grow up right in front of your eyes and you know you talk about guys wanting to seize an opportunity uh he is one of these guys where he has earned it he's done it the hard way he's sat on the bench and watched uh in the past this is his time he wants to step up in a big way. Take us through your thoughts on Jaden Catelier and what he'll need to do in this series. 
Well, his numbers have been uh, have kept getting better over the three seasons with the Terriers, and uh, he's a player. Uh, we've been looking back at the stats. We've tried to find a goaltender uh, in the last number of years that has been three years here in Portage. It doesn't happen a lot uh, in our uh, with our team, and so uh, he's a guy who's stuck around for three years, and this is a big opportunity for him to take in the playoffs. The Terriers coming in looked good against Winkler this season. They went uh, four and one, but just about every game was decided by a goal. Some of them going to extra time. It was an incredibly close series. I think uh, the series in the playoffs is going to be just as close. I can't wait to get it started. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be great hockey for a good chunk of the season. These were the number two and number three teams. And then some of the other teams in the West kind of caught up and made it close, but these are two of the top teams I feel in the MJHL going head to head in the first round. It's going to be a great series. And just a fun fact that doesn't really have much bearing on the playoffs or on this series specifically, but Blake Spillers never played against or never coached against Winkler in the playoffs. And so for all of the times that uh, the Terriers have been in the playoffs since Blake took over in the mid two thousands, they've never met Winkler. This will be the first time and uh, it's uh, quite a stat, but it, uh, it should be a fun one. That is uh, surprising and awesome. All rolled into one. Uh, Mando, uh, you know, I wanted to talk coaching side of things, but I actually want to go to a different route. Uh, Home ice advantage. Winkler earned it being the number two team versus the Terriers of the number three team. Uh, So I know it's very hard to play in Winkler. It's very hard to play in Portage. Take us through how how Portage can get through as a road team or what Winkler needs to do as the home team. Because like I said, both those buildings are so hard to play in. Well, no, no question. I think, you know, with Winkler and playing in their building and similar to uh, another small rink, right, where, you know, pucks get to the net in a hurry, right? So I think if Portage, you know, can check well, keep things to the outside and and create their, you know, that leads to their fast transition, they're going to, they might be able to get a couple um, quick ones and take over the game, right? Um, but then, you know, you go to Portage and they play that really well as well. So, it's, uh, I mean, it's a fun place to play. It's in one of the newer rinks, right? I'm sure it's going to be just humming with fans and, and uh, you know, the atmosphere is going to be fantastic with playoffs and such, right? So I think there is um, a home ice advantage in this series. And, you know, I think, you know, like, it's it's got the makings of one of the best, right? It's got to be, like, on there. as like, If you love hockey and you love playoff hockey and you love the MJ, you got to tune into this series. Both fan bases, especially in their rings, can make it feel like they're right on top of the opposing team, Winkler and Portage. Uh, of course, Winkler's got that old barn, like you said, with a ton of character. But Portage has a golden boy. Uh, so it, it, they both got, they got their pluses. Uh, it should be a really interesting series. Uh, let's go to predictions. Kevin Pauls, who do you like and in how many games Winkler Portage round one? Oh, this is such a tough one because, like you said, uh these are two tough teams going at it for the first round. I mean, the ticket uh, admission is going to be well worth uh, the, the cost. And um, I think it's going to be a smash them out, drag them out series. I think it's going to go the full seven um, with how things have structured in Winkler this year. It's hard for me not to pick the Winkler flyers. I think uh, them and their, their core group of big bodies are going to take this one, but it's going to go the full length seven games Winkler. Cody, we'll get your opinion on this, but uh, I think we kind of know where the wind is blowing there. But uh, give us your insight and and what you think of this series and then in how many games. Well, you can see the logos in the background, so you have probably a pretty good idea of what I'm going to say. But I think it's going to be a really close series. These are, like I've said, two of the top teams. I expect it to be a close series. Uh, like Kevin said, I think it definitely could go the distance. I think Portage uh, has the ability to take this series. And I'm hoping that the Terriers can uh, pull it out on home ice in six. So I'm saying Terriers in six. All right, Mando, you are probably the, the, the least biased of the other two. So uh, what do you (laughs) think about this series and uh, who do you like and in how many games? Yeah. Like I keep coming back to it. I'm excited to watch it and see it, right? Like you got, you know, from top to bottom, very comparable players. I think, you know, like, again, like, I just keep coming back to, to last year and how it ended for Winkler. I think they're going to be very, very hungry. I, I, you know, I'm going to give them the edge. But, um, but yeah, I think it's going to go seven. And I think it's going to be uh, one of those ones where you're going to look back on and, 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 you know, that would be, you know, kind of the catalyst for one team and then another team thinking, like, if, if only we had got past that, them, then, you know, who knows, right? So, I think, yeah, Winkler at seven. 
Yeah, I, I think you put it exactly right. It, what could have been if we just got out of round one? But I think whatever team comes out of round one is going to have a huge chunk taken out of them heading into round two because you're going to have to pay the price to win this series. Uh, so my prediction is going to be in seven games, I'm taking the Portage Terriers, and I'm going to go one step further. Game seven in overtime, the Terriers are going to uh, are going to go away with the win. So that's my not so hot take, but uh, Terriers in overtime in seven games because this series almost deserves a game seven in overtime because it's going to be just so darn good. Gentlemen, appreciate the time. Thank you so much for doing this.